Good evening. It's good to see you in the Lord's house tonight and those that have joined us through the live stream. Uh, thank you for joining with us and we trust that your soul will be blessed as well. Let us sing this hymn. There is a book that comes to me from one who spake of old, who calls with shepherd the voice, the flock that wanders from the fold. We'll stand together. that we'll know his blessing and we'll hear his voice tonight as we consider his word. Father in heaven, we draw nigh into thy holy presence in the name of our Savior. We praise you because you are the one from whom all blessings flow. We praise you because you are the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, and every good and every perfect gift cometh from you. We praise you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and thou hast given us this remarkable treasured gift of life. We praise you because we are made in thine image. We praise you because you sent your son to die for us, because we are so aware of the fact that we are a broken people. We are a sinful people. We are a wicked people, depraved, born with our thoughts and our inclinations, totally directed away from you. But we thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that Christ died for me, even for me. We praise you because you have prepared a home and glory for us. And one day when this life is over, one day whenever the uh, story of life has been written up and completed, that we will be with Christ, which will be far better. And we thank you, Lord, for the word of God, which is our map and our guide uh, through the unknown valleys and, and twisted corners of this world. And we know that thou art the one who goes before us, who leads and who guides and who maps out the path for us. And we pray that you would give us the grace to follow thee 
Give us the grace to lean upon thee and to trust thee. And we pray that our faith would be strengthened as we consider your word tonight, that we would be challenged in our hearts and that we would be brought near to God. And so we commit ourselves unto you. Continue with us now as we think upon your word. And may your word be that which would feed the soul for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Let us turn to the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 34. Second Chronicles 34, and we will begin reading at the verse 14. Second Chronicles 34, and we'll read from the verse 14. This is the third study in the life and the reign and indeed the ministry of King Josiah. He is converted. He has removed the, the idols from the land. And then he has started this work of restoring the temple. And as they were restoring the temple, a great discovery was made. And tonight we'll think about the discovery of an old book. Second Chronicles 34 and the verse 14. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Abdon the son of Micah and Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. Amen. We know that God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts. There is a certain mystery where old books are concerned. Ancient volumes, they carry the thoughts of a, a past generation. They are like ships, ships that are crossing the, the seas of time, ships that leave the shore of one generation and pass over time and deposit their precious contents, the thoughts of another generation and deposit those thoughts in the hearts and minds of others. And although the people that wrote those words, although the people that committed those thoughts to books, they have long since gone, their bones are dust, and yet their thinking remains, their ideas remain, their discoveries remain, the records of their lives remain, the historic records that they have written up, they remain, and they are there as precious treasures for another generation to delve into and to learn from. You know, we would be so poor, so poor, if we did not have the benefit of the learning of all the generations that have gone before us. Old books are precious, precious items. No old book, however, in the history of the world ever had a greater impact than the discovery of this old book in the temple during the restoration of the temple in the days of Josiah, king of Judah. And it is the discovery of this old book that we're going to think about tonight. Let's think about the title of the old book that was discovered. And it is simply called the book of the law. In verse 14 and verse 15, it's the book of the law. Now, some scholars have wondered, what, what was this book? Was it the, the Torah, 
the five books of Moses, from Genesis through to Deuteronomy. Others have said, oh, no, no, it, it was only Deuteronomy because surely they would have had the, the knowledge of, of Moses and, and, and the Genesis account and the Exodus account and the passing through the Red Sea. They, they had all of that. Surely all of that wasn't lost. It must have been just Deuteronomy or a part of Deuteronomy that, that they found. And, and there is certainly application from Deuteronomy that would point to the importance of Deuteronomy with reference to what Josiah had discovered and the impact that it had upon him. But it is a dangerous thing to suggest that it was only Deuteronomy that was found because the higher critics in the 19th century, they come up with this idea that Deuteronomy wasn't written by Moses, that it was written by a, a future generation written many, many years after Moses, written even in the days of Josiah. And of course, that is a lie from the pit of hell itself because if Deuteronomy was not written by Moses, then we cannot trust the Bible because the Bible is quite clear that Deuteronomy is one of the books of Moses. And the Lord himself talked about the law and the law to the ancient Jew was always the five books of Moses. And so, when the book of the law is referred to here, we must believe that it was the Torah, the book that the Jews always accepted as the, the five-fold volume written by the hand of Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is called the book of the law because the law is not just found in, in Deuteronomy. It's, it's found in Numbers. It's found in Leviticus. It's, it's found in Exodus. And the law contains God's regulations, God's code for his covenant people. Uh, there is the, the ceremonial laws that had to be observed. There was all the Levitical ceremonies that had to be observed. There were all the, the laws that were applicable for Israel, how they were to conduct themselves. And the people could not possibly know what God required of them without the law. It was God's law. It wasn't the law of men. It was the, the law of the Lord. And instantly we can understand the solemnity that this priest had when he discovered the book and he lifted it with trembling hands and he handed it over to Shap and the scribe and the scribe came and gave it to the king. The law of the Lord. Oh, that we would have a sense of what a book this is. A book to be treasured. The Psalm 119 was very probably written by a scribe. We know that it, it, well, it certainly isn't a scribe to David. It's not one of the Psalms that is said to be a Psalm of David, and perhaps David did write it. We can't be absolutely sure, but we'll talk about the role of the scribe tonight. And the scribe was the man who spent his whole life with the book, with the law. And the Psalm 119 talks about the law of God in virtually every verse. And in the verse 72 of the Psalm 119, we have these words, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. A book to be treasured. This old book was a treasured book. It was the law of the Lord. And then secondly, let's think about the neglect of the old book. Because in this verse 14, Hilkiah the priest, he comes to shop on the scribe and he says, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. If you find something, that means you've lost it, you haven't had it. That means it, it's been cast aside, had to be discovered again. And there is a, a tragedy here in this because suddenly we are given an insight into a whole generation. There were a whole generation of, of people in Judah who were bereft of the law of God. They didn't have the Bible. Ever since the death of Hezekiah, the law had been neglected. During the, the long reign, over 50 years of, of Manasseh's reign, and during the very short two-year reign of Ammon, so for over half a century, the law of God was not read. The law of God was not read before the people in the temple because the doors of the temple had been shut up. 
There was no scriptures. There was no law. God's law had been totally and absolutely set to the one side. There had been a, a neglect of the scripture. Even the priests and the scribes were without the word of God. And this old volume had been cast aside. And over the years, other stuff had been put on top of it and the dust had come and, and it had been forgot about until Hilkiah said, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. The years before the ascension of Josiah to the throne were years of apostasy, of falling away from the Lord. And apostasy is always characterized by a neglect of the Bible. Where there is a neglect of the Bible, there is backsliding and there is apostasy. The Dark Ages, that period before the Reformation, is known in history as the Dark Ages. It was a time of terrible ignorance and superstition, but above all, it was a time when the people were bereft of the Bible. People weren't allowed to have the Bible. People weren't allowed to learn the Bible in their own language. People were even persecuted for quoting the Lord's Prayer in the English tongue. The Bible was not available. It was a dark time. And whenever a generation is without the Bible, there's darkness. The very fact that this book was neglected gives us an insight into the period of history leading up to the renovation of the temple here in Second Chronicles 34. Let's also think about the finding of the old book. It was a happy thing for Shapan to come to the king in the verse 18 and say, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. I've got a book. What a book it is. Now, when the priest found the book, he knew about the contents because the contents of this book had certainly been passed down from one generation to the next. The, the people knew, especially the religious leadership would have known what was in the book. And whenever he found the book, he, he found it. This is the book. We, we need to read this book. We must have this book. We have longed for this book. And then he handed it to Shapin. And why did he hand it to Shapin? Because Shapin was the man who had the custody of the book. We should never fail to underestimate the importance of the scribe in the history of ancient Israel. The scribe was the man who had the keys to the book. The scribe copied the book out for another generation. In fact, his work was scribing, writing, copying. That God's word might be handed to another generation. That was his job, to write the copies. But it wasn't just about copying. It was about copying with exactness and with accuracy because this was the word of God. No mistakes can dare enter this book. And so it was a, a spiritual work. But then the scribe would have taken those copies and would have filed them and would have treasured them. And whenever a copy of the scriptures got old and worn, he did a very surprising thing to it. At least we would find it surprising. He took that worn copy and he burnt it. And the reason why he burned it was this, because it was worn. Some of the words were no longer legible. And because of that, somebody could lift up this worn copy of the Bible and could misread the contents. And in so doing, error would creep in amongst the people. And so the old copies that didn't contain the entire word had to be destroyed, lest apostasy set in. The scribe was a man who took his work very seriously. No one knew the Bible like the scribe. He read it. He meditated upon it. He wrote every letter carefully. He loved the scriptures. And he was a man who was answerable to God for keeping the scriptures. And here was a man who was a scribe. And yet he had no Bible to protect. He had no scriptures to copy. And, and whenever the king gave the order to open up the temple, there was this anticipation. And no doubt the scribe and the priest had talked about it. Oh, will we find a copy of the law? 
we find one of the old copies. And so they longed for this. And what thrill there must have been in the heart of Shapin when Hilkiah came to him and said, I found the book of the law. I found it there in the house of the Lord. We have got the book. And what a book it is. We have books, but we have Bibles. And we have more than one Bible. And we have it so freely available. And yet our hearts are not thrilled within us as we think of the book. They ought to be. The reading of the old book. Shapan read it before the king. And this was one of the jobs of the, the scribe as well, was to read the book and to read it out loud for the congregation and for the audience and for this purpose. He read it to the king. And verse 18 simply says that Shapan read it before the king. Ezra is a great example. Some people believe, you know, Ezra wrote the, the great Psalm 119. Ezra was the most famous scribe in Jewish history. And the reason why he was the most famous scribe in Jewish history was because during the Babylonian exile, the Jews gave Ezra the credit under God for taking the copies of the scriptures that were in the temple and of treasuring them and of keeping them in, in Babylon and protecting them for another generation. And whenever the temple was rebuilt, they had the scriptures. And in the book of Ezra, we have the record of Ezra standing on the pulpit. The only time the word pulpit is ever used in the scriptures. And he read the Bible before the people. The priest read the scriptures word for word. It is a, a blessing that these men recognized the importance of the book. The Reverend Andrew Stewart, I've referred to him before, in his book, Second Chronicles, A House of Prayer, he, he speculates upon the possibility of these people neglecting the scriptures. And this is what he said. The book of the law was just a dusty old scroll lying in the corner of the temple. It could very easily have been swept aside by those who were doing an important task for the Lord. They were restoring the house of the Lord, not preserving ancient relics. And in so doing, they might easily have missed the importance of the scroll. That would have been a tragic loss. But that is what busy Christians often do today. They are busy with church life and meetings. They enjoy fellowship with other believers. Perhaps they are out every night of the week attending Christian activities, but they hardly take time to read the Bible for themselves. If they do read it, they barely take time to feed upon it and listen carefully to the Lord as they read. That is why Bible-believing Christians need to learn to be Bible-reading Christians. Three words. These men had just passed over the scroll. Ah, it's just an old, an old book. Just threw it in the dustbin. We're clearing up. Getting ready for a new generation. That old book, just leave it alone. We'll not take time with it. With so many other important things to do, renovating this temple, let's forget about that old book. And yet that old book was the reason why they were doing the work. That was the Lord's book. And we can be so, so busy, we can neglect the word. And we can leave the Bible in the corner and not read it as we ought to be reading it. And yet the secret for a successful Christian life is found in that book. And we will be as poor as rich spiritually as we give ourselves to the book. And we need to take that to heart to be a people who read the book. Finally, let's think about the impact of the, the old book. This old book had a dramatic impact. You know, the book was old, but the words were fresh and the words were new. And that's exactly how the Bible should be. It is the oldest of books, but yet its effect should be fresh upon the soul and upon the heart. And that's how it was for the king. Because in the verse 19, we read, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. You know, the king was doing a great, great work. He was doing something that hadn't been done for a generation or more. 
He was restoring the temple, rebuilding the temple. He had done so many great things, but the book did not commend him. The book did not clap him on the shoulder and say, this is a great work you're doing. No, the book highlighted the shortcomings of the nation. Sometimes we are too good at trying to clap ourselves in the back and we become filled with pride. The book deals with our pride. The book humbles us. The book shows our sins. The book shows us how far we come short. The book shows us how much we need the grace of God. And as the king heard the words of the book, he was smitten because of his sin and the sin of the nation. And you notice what he did in the verse 20. He called together Hilkiah and Achiah and Ahikam and the son of Shaphan and Abdon, the son of Micah and Shaphan the scribe, Messiah, servant of the king, saying, this is what he wanted them to do. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. They realized that wrath was coming. They realized that the whole land had an appointment with God and it was an appointment of judgment that God's wrath was coming and God's wrath would certainly come because they had broken the law of God. Judgment day was coming. He had a vision of God's judgment coming upon the nation. That was why he was so sorrowful. And certainly there is an indicator that as he came to the end of the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, well, there were solemn things. Turn with me over to Deuteronomy chapter 28, please. Look at verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his judgments, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and rebuke and all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be perished and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust from heaven shall it come down upon thee until it be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth and thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth and no man shall fray them away. The Lord shall smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with emeralds and with the scab and with the itch whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at the noonday as the blind gropeth in the darkness and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. No man shall save thee. And that's not the end. It goes on and on. The curses that will come upon them for breaking the law of God. And this man's grandfather had even offered children as human sacrifices. That's how bad it had got. And you get a sense of the, the terrible heartbrokenness that Josiah experienced as he heard these things. This was the, the word of God. You know, we get a sense of the word of God, it's a living book and it has to be a living book. It's not a dead book, it's a living book, it's alive. 
The book must live. The book must convert. The book must convict. The word must breathe. And that again is what happened at the Protestant Reformation. The word of God began to move. Martin Luther was converted. He got a sense of that great doctrine that just shall live by faith. Tyndale gave his life to giving the English speaking people the scriptures in their own language at the ploughboy might of the, the Bible. The word of God is something that revolutionizes, it revives, it restores the power of the book. And Whenever this man, Josiah, heard the book and he was smoten with conviction, what did he want? He wanted to know more. Go inquire of the Lord. For me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, we might say Josiah hadn't committed the sins that the, the book condemned the nation for. The nation had committed those sins, but people that sat in Josiah's throne had committed these sins, and therefore there was this collective sense of guilt that came upon him the guilt of the whole nation, the guilt of his father and his grandfather. It all came upon his heart and soul, and therefore he was crying unto God, we need a word from the Lord today in this dark day. Josiah, he didn't make excuses. He didn't run away from the word. He didn't blame others. He took the word to heart himself, and he cried out, and he cried out for God. And whenever the word of God challenges our sin, we should never run away and we should never make excuses. We should face the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me. Be merciful to me in this dark day. You know, we look at our land, we look at our nation. We look at the sins of our nation. We look at the spiritual bankruptcy. We look at the spiritual delinquency. We look at the abortion. We look at the sodomy. We see what's happening in our nation. They're turning away from God and surely we must see judgment is coming. God will not turn a blind eye like a doting grandfather to the sins of the grandchildren. God judges sin. He deals with sin. But here was a man who was willing to stand in the gap to rend his clothes and to pray and to cry out to God in this day. Is that not our calling? Josiah, as the sin was exposed, he cried and he wept and he pleaded. He sought to go deeper with God and revival came. And the greatest of all the revivals in Judah came during the reign of this man. What an encouragement that is. We think it's a dark day and it is. But can God come and do great things in this day? Of course he can. And if he can do it in Josiah's day, he can do it in our day. Matthew Henry wrote this, and with this we close. We may hence learn, whenever we read or hear the word of God, to affect our hearts with it and to get them possessed with a holy fear of that wrath of God which is there revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men as Josiah's tender heart was. When he heard the words of the law, he rent his clothes. And God was well pleased with his doing so. Were the things contained in the scripture new to us as they were here to Josiah? Surely they would make deeper impressions upon us than commonly they do. But they are not the less weighty and therefore should not be the less considered by us for their being well known. Rend the heart, therefore not the garments. End of quote. And that's the thought, isn't it? This was the first time Josiah had heard this. It affected him. Oh, for the, the vision to always hear the scriptures as those who hear it for the first time. Be greedy for it. The word of God might move our hearts and bring us near to him. May the Lord write these words upon our hearts and our souls tonight. As we get before the Lord for prayer, there's just a few prayer requests I want to bring before you. Do you need to pray for Kenneth Lockhart, please? Uh, please remember little Leo, Leslie and Valerie's great grandson, who is ill in hospital. Pray for Leo. Remember uh, Wendy Robinson's mother, Mrs. McConnell. She is unwell, and just pray for Mrs. McConnell at this time. Also, Mrs. Isabel Whitaker had surgery today, and she's recovering. And pray for Isabel that she'll know the touch of the Lord.
And for others that are sick and laid aside and others that are elderly and infirm, bring them all, please, before the Lord. We were challenging the Lord today to pray for Ukraine, to pray for our own land, our own nation. And let's bring that before the Lord as well. Do you remember the work of God as it continues here in this place and pray that we'll know a stirring of the Lord. Thank you for joining us. If you're on the live stream, pray with us, please. And we trust that God will bless you. And let's seek the Lord now for prayer. We'll ask our brother Andrew Mullen to lead us in prayer. And then one after another, let's seek the Lord tonight.